It is a great pleasure to welcome you all to this two-day celebration of the 50 years of the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law. India has a long association with the Commission, and it is fitting that this event, the only one of its kind outside the Commission's seat in Vienna, is being held here in New Delhi. We are deeply honoured that both the President of India and the Chief Justice of India have taken the time to be with us today. ANCITRAL was established by the UN General Assembly on the 17th of December 1966 as the core legal body of the UN system in the field of international trade law, focusing on the modernization and harmonization of rules on international business. Much has been accomplished in 50 years, starting with the field in which I practice international arbitration. Ancitral has been the guardian for all but its eight first years of the cornerstone of international arbitration, the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. Its model law on international commercial arbitration, which this jurisdiction embraced 20 years ago now, has altered the nature of the relationship between national courts and arbitral tribunals, helping turn international arbitration into a self-standing form of international dispute resolution rather than the poor parent of domestic litigation. Its rules of arbitration, first published in 1976, have become the standard set of rules for non-institutional ad hoc arbitration, both in the commercial field and in the investment field. Its newly published rules on tra transparency in treaty-based investor state arbitration are being used as a matter of course in new treaties and the Mauritius Convention on Transparency signed last year in my home country of Mauritius provides states with a new and creative solution to increase transparency and legitimacy in their networks of existing investment treaties. I see many familiar faces today, arbitration practitioners, who will be well aware of these milestone achievements. But, as I discovered during my years at the helm of the Commission, the harmonization work of ANCITRAL goes far beyond this area uh, in uh, fields such as electronic commerce, to cross-border insolvency, to the regulation of microfinance. To take just this last example, microfinance, it is only during my time as chairman of the Commission that I came to understand the challenges which this important tool of social engineering faces. What many see as a wonderful way to promote entrepreneurship and relieve poverty, others unfortunately have seen as a means of exploiting the poor, unhindered by the framework of a regulated banking environment. How does one regulate such an activity without destroying the flexibility which lies at its core? This is a challenge that numerous countries in the world started facing at exactly the same point in time. And when they did, they knew they could turn to ANCITRAL, a forum where states can come together to solve common problems in the field of commercial law in a coordinated and harmonized manner. For those of you who have never attended an ANCITRAL session or the session of one of its working groups, the Commission sits as an emanation of the United Nations General Assembly with all UN member states represented in the room. Although it does have 60 official member states, there is in fact no segregation or separation between the member states and other uh, UN member states. And all UN member states have an equal voice during deliberations. And all decisions are reached by consensus. There has to this day never been a vote on a substantive matter at ANCITRAL. All its texts have been adopted by consensus with a unanimous or near unanimous approval of all UN member states. This has been singled out by some as the great weakness of ANCITRAL. Matters that could be agreed upon and drafted by specialists in the field in a matter of days 
or weeks take years. Model legislation, rules, all this will take weeks and weeks of commission, general assembly time, uh, rather than the few days that it should have taken, some say. I would humbly submit that it is in fact Ancitra's great strength. The full multilateral debates which take place on the floor of Ancitral and the consensual method by which its texts are adopted are the conditions sine qua non for the creation of legitimate legal standards acceptable to all countries, irrespective of their state of development or political model. This has served the community of nations well for its past 50 years. We should not forget it as we face new challenges. India has, over the past few years, started to grapple with the difficulties which the development of investor state dispute settlement, or ISDS, has created for developing countries. Its reaction, not unlike that of other states, has been one of rejection of the ISDS model, manifested by the denunciation of its existing investment treaties and the publication of an Indian model bilateral investment treaty with pared down standards of treatment and pared down recourse to arbitration for the resolution of disputes between investors and host state. As it pursues its unilateral and bilateral efforts in this area, India should not forget that it is not alone. Many states, both developing and developed, find themselves at a similar crossroad. Now, as then, I would humbly suggest that the solution must be multilateral. As we shall be discussing tomorrow, efforts have started within Ancitral to use the mechanism of the Mauritius Convention on Transparency to replace the existing system of investor state arbitration with a permanent multilateral investment court. Developed and developing countries, including the European Union and many members of the G77, are prepared to join forces to make this a reality. India should support this project as it has supported past Ancitral initiatives, both because Ancitral stands to benefit from India's support and leadership and because India stands to benefit from this initiative. We shall be discussing this topic and others central to the work of Ancitral over the next two days. I very much look forward to debating them with you and to continue in this temporary forum the work which Ancitral has been carrying out for the past 50 years within its more permanent structures, that of fostering and developing uniform and harmonized global standards for rule-based commerce. Before concluding, I would like to pay tribute to the newly established Ancitral Coordination Committee, India, and to its chairman, Mr. Fali Nariman, if I may say so, a model to us all, uh, its Vice Chairman, Mr. Gurab Banerjee, and coordinators, Mr. George Potan and Mr. Shreyas Jayasima. Uh, thanks also go to the Ancitral Regional Center for Asia and the Pacific, and to the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague, without whose dedication and hard work we would not be here together today. I wish you all a thought-provoking conference, and thank you for your attention. Golden Jubilee celebration is a commemorative event for any institution. It is doubly joyful when the Golden Jubilee happens to be of a subsidiary body of the General Assembly of the United Nations. As head of the judiciary, which in this country is an epitome of justice and rule of law, I congratulate Ancitral, its chairperson and representatives of Ancitral, UNCC India office bearers and the distinguished lawyers on the 50th anniversary of Ancitral. I take special pride in the fact that India has stood by Ancitral in this glorious journey of 50 years 
right from the formative years of Ansitral in 1968. This year is truly historic for India. In the beginning of this year, in February 2016, we took over the BRICS presidency and very successfully organized BRICS summit and BRICS legal forum summit. India has now been re-elected for a period of six years from 2016 to 2022 as a member state to the UNCITRAL in keeping with its unbeaten membership since 1968. I take this opportunity to extend my compliments to the Government of India and to the UNCC India for keeping pace with the global policy maker of international commerce and for achieving several milestones. Friends, it is not just a protocol requirement or an international obligation for any ancestral member state to support and abide by the globally relevant legal principles of international trade law developed by ancestral. But this is the most imminent global need based on mutual necessity for ensuring global standards for rule-based commerce. I find the broad thematic subject lines of this conference truly benefiting and befitting the contemporary international context. The fundamental objective of UNCITRAL, we all know, was to promote progressive harmonization and unification of international trade law internationally. The task was most exigent <clears throat> to generate consensus for establishing an internationally relevant and acceptable normative legal order benefiting all. The international diversity in the political and legal systems, including within the groups of developed and developing jurisdictions, would have always precluded emergence of such a global order of trade and commerce. This is where the establishment of UNCITRAL assumed international acceptability and recognition under the aegis of the United Nations General Assembly. While we rejoice the 50th, 50th year of our joint efforts in promoting a global normative order of international trade and commerce, we also need to evaluate what we have accomplished and the way forward. To me, this 50 years long journey of UNCITRAL is fascinating in more than one ways. The world today practices nine varieties of internationally recognized global standards and rule-based commerce in the form of international conventions and model laws. The world cannot imagine a coherent trade order without mutually agreed upon rules to settle disputes amicably, timely, and effectively. UNCITRAL made it possible through the Convention on the Recognition of Enforcement of Foreign Awards, New York, 1958. Both the developed and the developing countries would not have benefited as they have in the absence of a modern, uniform and fair regime for contracts for international sale of goods. The UNCITRAL promoted such a regime through the United Nations Convention on Contracts for International Sale of Goods, Vienna 1980, by facilitating certainty in the commercial exchanges and decreasing transaction costs. To further stabilize the global trade, we have also witnessed the United Nations Convention on the Assignment of Receivables in International Trade. This was an effort largely to promote the movement of goods and services across national borders by facilitating increased access to lower cost credit. Some other essential and universally beneficial legal regimes prescribed and promoted by the UNCITRAL include International UNCITRAL Model Law on Cross-Border Insolvency to assist member states to equip their insolvency laws with a modern legal framework. United Nations Convention on Independent Guarantees and Standby Letter of Credit. United Nations Convention on International Bills of Exchange and International Promissory Notes towards promising and promoting equilibrium in practices of international payments. United Nations Convention on Contracts for International Carriage of Goods, wholly or partly by sea, also called the Rotterdam Rules. United Nations Convention on the Liability of Operators 
of transport terminals in international trade, Vienna 1991, United Nations Convention on the Carriage of Goods by Sea, Hamburg 1978, the Hamburg Rules, towards establishing a uniform legal regime governing the rights and obligations of shippers, carriers and consignees, the United Nations Convention on the Use of Electronic Communications in International Contracts, New York 2005, to facilitate the use of electronic communications in international trade and model law on public procurement and infrastructure and technical notes on online dispute resolution. I must say this is an outstanding contribution any international institution could have made for promoting a universal legal regime for harmonious international trade and commerce transactions. Most of these guidelines in the form of conventions and model laws became a catalyst for the major world democracies and economies to re revisit their municipal laws in these areas and realign the same with the global trends of lawmaking while respecting ancestral approach. I take pride in saying that India has been one of the major contributors to the ancestral model laws and has been part of several working groups. In its 18th session held between 3rd and 21st of June 1985, India had a substantial role to play to usher in the era of ancestral model law on international commercial arbitration. India has also led two ancestral sessions, the fourth session led by Dr. Nagendra Singh in 1971 and the 19th session led by Mr. P. K. Kartha in 1986. Representing the Indian judiciary, I am delighted to see that Ancestral's vision is not restricted to creating new legal value system in the form of universally acceptable conventions, but also in harnessing rich jurisprudence generated by the genius of the judiciary internationally. No legal system can flourish and yield effective results without the progressive interpretation of the law with the changing needs of the society. In the context of international legal order, the role of diverse judicial systems assumes greater significance. To collate diverse legal opinions of the distinct judicial structures and approaches from all corners of the world is therefore critical in the pursuit of making a common global regime for international trade and commerce. I congratulate UNCITRAL and its office bearers for re recognizing the judicial efforts in this direction through developing a system of case law on UNCITRAL text uh, in short clout. I applaud, applaud this initiative and the initiative of UNCITRAL to facilitate uniform interpretation and application of UNCITRAL text by collecting and disseminating information on court decisions and arbitral awards relating to conventions and model laws that have emanated from the work of the Commission. There cannot be any better evidence of the commendable work which UNCITRAL has done than seeing several Indian cases such as UNICEF's India Private Limited versus Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Enercon India Limited versus Enercon of GPMH as part and parcel of Cloud Digest. India did not stop at merely contributing to the development of UNCITRAL, but has also been one of the very active compliants of the UNCITRAL normative approach of changing the international way of business by balancing the international trade law. Our Information Technology Act of 2000 is a classic example of fulfillment of India's international obligations. Under this law, we have accepted the principles enshrined in the ancestral model law on electronic commerce. The much talked about arbitration regime of the world benefited most from the ancestral model law on international commercial arbitration. <clears throat> India was one of the foremost member states which modernized its arbitration law of 1940s following the new structure and principles prescribed by the model law. Consequently, in the year 1996, we replaced our more than five decades old arbitration law by Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996. Ancitral kept pace with the changing international standards in the field of dispute settlement and continued to develop the branch of arbitration law. India followed it actively. 
India also closely followed the international change in this branch of law. I take pride yet again in apprising you that all that no sooner uh, that no sooner the Law Commission of India gave its recommendations for an overhaul of the Indian arbitration law, the Indian Parliament moved a bill in this regard. And in January 2016, we saw coming into force Arbitration and Conciliation Amendment Act of 2015. This amendment is full of modern culture of ensuring greater transparency in arbitration proceedings, strictly promoting timely, timeliness in completion of arbitral, arbitration proceedings, and minimizing the judicial intervention in arbitral awards. Ladies and gentlemen, there can certainly not have been a better time to commemorate Ancitra's 50 years in India than 2016, a year that remodernized arbitration law on the lines of Ancitra model law, and also established commercial courts in India to resolve exclusively the commercial disputes, making India all poised to take on the world stage in the realm of international trade as well as international dispute resolution. Many of you may not know that under the aegis of BRICS Legal Forum, India will soon establish an international arbitration center in Delhi to strengthen the regional arbitration culture with a special focus on BRICS-related trade dispute resolution. This will be in addition to the International Center for Alternative Disputes Resolution, ICDR, of which Chief Justice of India is the ex officio president. The Indian Supreme Court has also taken a policy decision to invest in capacity building of judicial officers, especially in the newer areas that require greater judicial help in settling the many conflicting positions of law. One such decision involves training of judicial officers in the recently launched National Intellectual Property Rights Policy of India 2016. And now, from this stage today, I call upon the Indian legislators to act ahead of time by formulating, debating, and launching the arbitration policy of India, thereby strengthening India's role in Asia-Pacific region in setting truly global standards of rule-based commerce. Lastly, ladies and gentlemen, I once again congratulate the genius of the organizers for being very thoughtful in choosing the business sessions of these two days' conference. Thematic come business sessions like pivotal role of UNCITRAL in the development of international commercial law and lessons for the future, redefining arbitrability, future of cross-border consistency, and innovation for reforms for efficiency and legitimacy in investment arbitration, I believe would be most critical for India's investment market viewpoint. I have taken note that galaxy of international subject experts are going to speak and deliberate over the next two days on this most critical on these most critical issues of contemporary global trade and commerce. I wish the conference all success and would be much happier to know the reflections of the fruitful deliberations of two days. In the end, I hope both Ancitral and India continue to work for a progressive collaboration in the years to come to make global standards for rule-based commerce a universal approach and reality. Thank you and Jai Hind. It's indeed a pleasure for me to be present amidst you this morning to deliver the keynote address on the historic occasion of the 50th anniversary of United Nations Commission on International Trade Law. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, building on its ancient civilization, commitment to deep humanism and the universal values of peace and fraternity, India has been a founding member of several multilateral institutions ranging from the old League of Nations to modern United Nations, international labor organizations, and indeed, UNCITRAL. UNCITRAL was established in 1966 with a recognition that international trade cooperation among states is an important factor in the promotion of friendly relations and consequently in the maintenance of peace and security. 
through its several model laws, conventions, legislative guides, and robust debates in working groups, UNCITRAL has provided a valuable platform to countries to compare, examine, debate, and adopt principles of international, commercial, and trade law appropriate to their circumstances. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, today's gathering brings to mind another momentous occasion on 50th anniversary of the United Nations itself. I had the privilege of <coughs> speaking and addressing the 12th plenary of the 50th session of United Nations General Assembly in September 1995. In the context of the modern multilateral organizations, 50 years represent an opportunity to assess what has been achieved and to determine what are required to be done to reach our destination. India is delighted to host the Golden Jubilee celebrations of UNCITRAL as part of our commitment to the purposes and principles of the United Nations and the evolutions of its specialized programs and agreement agencies. India's enhanced role in diverse multilateral and regional fora is evident from recent developments in Arctic Council, Pacific Alliance, BRICS Summit, BIMSTEC, and the United Nations Security Council, where India seeks a permanent membership legitimately. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it's a growing testament to India's commitment to the rule of law, and India is only one of the eight countries that has been a member of UNCITRAL from its inception and has recently been also re-elected for a term of six years. We appreciate the support we have received from the international community to achieve it. India recognizes that the impact of the UNCITRAL has been far beyond mere felicitation of international trade. Its exemplary work over the years provided significant thought leadership that has inspired transformation of several domestic legal re regimes to facilitate both domestic and transnational commerce and trade. During my tenure as Commerce Minister, I had several rounds of negotiations that led to the establishment of the World Trade Organization in 1995 at the conclusions of the Uruguay round and on the basis of the formal drunkle draft. The diversity of economic interests, languages, legal systems, and cultures in organizations such as WTO and UNCITRAL is indeed staggering. It is therefore a great achievement by UNCITRAL to have created conventions and model laws which are acceptable worldwide. In addition, UNCITRAL has created practical legal and legislative guides and provided technical assistance for <coughs> law reforms apart from maintaining an updated database of uniform commercial law and judicial decisions. UNCITRAL's convention and its model legal texts have formed the basis of the new enactments in India and amendments to a wide array of our commercial legislations ranging from the Arbitration and Conciliation Act of 1996 Information Technology Act 2000 and the Securitization and Reconstruction of Financial Assets and Enforcement of the Security Interest Act 2002, to name a few. Ladies and gentlemen, undoubtedly, one of the most successful conventions ever adopted by the United Nations is the United Nations Convention on the recognition 
and enforcement of arbitral awards 1951-58, which is also known as the New York Convention, and it deserves special mention. Unsettled seminal model law on international commercial arbitrations 1985 has formed the bedrock of India's Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996. While India has had a long history of peaceful resolution of the disputes from the days of Panchayati system onwards to several enactments concerning arbitration prior to independence, the year 1996 marked a watershed in the development and modernization of the arbitration law in India. India has only last month launched a national initiative towards strengthening arbitration and conciliation in India, which I had the privilege of formally inaugurating. I am convinced that India has the potential to emerge as a leading seat of international dispute resolution. The Honorable Prime Minister of India has declared that an enabling alternate dispute resolution ecosystem is a national priority for India and that we need to promote India globally as an arbitration hub. To this end, critical amendments have been made to the Arbitration and Conciliation Act to ensure timely and just resolution of arbitral disputes. I am confident that your deliberations will explore ways and means of fostering a healthy and sustainable culture of international arbitration and conciliation. Deliberations in this two-day conference on important topics ranging from commercial arbitration, investor state dispute settlement mechanisms, insolvency, electronic commerce, and UNCTRAL's role in Asia will catalyze and rejuvenate UNCTRAL's efforts towards harmonization of critical international trade and commercial legislation. Distinguished participants, India's economic growth in the last two decades has attracted immense investor interests. India's FDI inflows stood at 44 billion US dollar in 2015, making it the 10th largest recipient of such inflows, according to the World Investment Report 2016, issued by UNCTAD. India has, over the past year, undertaken several foreign investment liberalization measures with a view to providing an impetus to foreign investment in the country. I would like to take a moment here to highlight India's role in the thought leadership within the global trade and in investment regime. India has concluded several free trade agreements, comprehensive economic cooperation agreements, comprehensive economic partnership agreements, and preferential trading arrangements, and is currently negotiating more such agreements. India is also playing a key role in the regional <coughs> comprehensive and economic partnership negotiations. India is also a signatory to several bilateral investment treaties and investment chapters in comprehensive economic and other trade agreements. In recognition of the changing investment landscape, India has last year amended its model bilateral investment treaty to align the objective of the investment with sustainable development and inclusive growth of the parties. While welcoming and protecting foreign investment, the new model bilateral investment treaty reaffirms the right of the parties to regulate investments in their territory in accordance with their law and policy objectives, including the right to change the conditions applicable to such investments. It is heartening to note that UNCTRAL is taking the lead in furthering debate and harmonization in the sphere of the investor-state dispute settlement. 
distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. On the one hand, global geopolitical instability, terrorism and economic downturns have caused a visible strain on the global trade regime. On the other hand, technological advances and economic imperatives are binding trade and commerce across the boundaries closer than ever before. India's sustained growth rate of over 7% is, around, is among the highest in the world amongst the la <coughs> large economy and its larger domestic market has attracted the global enterprises of the highest caliber. India is therefore uniquely placed to contribute to the development of the legal principles for harmonization and unification in commercial and trade laws. It is in such times of change that institutions such as ancestral be become even more relevant, bringing legal, financial and technical experts together to contemplate and design the legal framework for future trade and commerce. The international platform for negotiation of ancestral instruments involved member states, non-member states, and invited intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations. The ancestral success is predominantly due to the non-political nature of its objectives, that is to promote inclusion of different organizations in order to develop a body of law that would have the potential of being accepted by countries with minimal resistance. The vision with which the ancestral proceeds is to take the world along with it. The ancestral's objectives stand integrated with the realms of the different legal regimes in the world, that is civil law, common law amongst the others. The harmonious nature of deliberation and consolidation into principles represents one of the surest <coughs> protections of international peace and security. Over the past 50 years, since its inception, ancestral has been recognized as the central arm of the United Nations system in the field of international trade and commercial law. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, this conference is an occasion for us to truly understand the impact of ancestral on the world at large, while also enabling us to identify the new venture that ought to be taken in order to further purpose the goal of the ancestral in adopting a progressive set of laws that can be utilized by all countries for promoting international peace and prosperity. With these words, I welcome you once again to this conference to celebrate the 50 years of ancestral. I wish you Godspeed and all success in your deliberations. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for patience. Jai Hind.